Welcome back to Morgan's video blog, Morgan's online blog in video format. Today, I'm here to share with you commas, the joy and bane of writers everywhere. <sighs> so, there are a lot of opinions. If you ask 100 writers the proper use of commas, you'll likely get 100 and one or more answers. The grammar rules might not have changed much, but the guidelines and editorial preferences sure have. This post is a bit more grammatically technical than usual, but I hope you'll hang in there for the ride. So, you ready to get started? Where to you use commas. First off, me being me, I would be quite remiss if I had any discussion of commas without discussing the Oxford comma. On Twitter, my pinned tweet as of this post has been for quite some time declaring fellow lovers and admirers of the Oxford comma supreme. For those of you unfamiliar with the term, the Oxford comma refers to the use of the comma before the word and during a list of items. It's also known as the serial comma. For example, Morgan comma Sarah comma and Kelly went to the coffee shop to write. That's the use of the Oxford comma. Now, without it, it would be Morgan comma Sarah and Kelly went to the coffee shop to write. No comma after Sarah. Now, while I would love to claim it is necessary, I must admit the truth. The Oxford comma is usually optional unless the meaning of the sentence would be confused without it. There have been legal instances where it's been crucial. You will, however, see plenty of memes with sentences arranged to make the meaning garbled without the Oxford comma. Take this next example. The implication is that the writer's parents are named Anne Rand and God. Quote unquote, this book is dedicated to my parents, comma, Anne Rand and God. Source random internet meme. If you know whose book it was, let me know in the comments. Obviously, if my parents was listed last, this wouldn't be a concern. This book is dedicated to Anne Rand, God, and my parents. So the second use of commas is conjoining independent clauses. So independent clauses, for those of you who are rusty on your grammar, are effectively two sentences conjoined with a conjunction. Check out conjunction junction. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise known as and, but, or, because. Basically, if both ha halves of the sentence can stand alone as a complete sentence, you need a comma. I.e., I'm going to write my blog post, comma, and you get to see it tomorrow, period. So, the third place you need commas is around phrases that are not at the end of the sentence. What do I mean by phrases? Dependent phrases. If you're not like me and you didn't spend your summers doing grammar books that your mother gave you, you might not be as familiar with the next few concepts. The first type of phrases I'm going to talk about are introductory or conditional, like the if part, if your mother, um, of that sentence I just said, or things like when I was younger, blah, 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 that sort of thing. The next type of phrases are prepositional phrases, although you can sometimes ignore the commas for the short ones. Prepositions, for those of you who are rusty, are words that tell of spatial or timing relationships. On the box, in the box, in my stomach, with the cookies, around the corner, after lunch, so let's use them in sentences with commas. If the phrase is at the start of the sentence, comma, you put the comma after it. 
Second example, for phrases in the middle of the sentence, comma, on the other hand, comma, you bracket the phrase with commas. Ah, describe and illustrate at the same time. The comma is often not necessary at the end of the sentence. No comma there. So there are two caveats to this rule. The big one is if the sentence would not make sense without the phrase or the phrase is part of the subject, then the comma should be omitted. So my example here is the writer in the red shirt is running away. So the writer in the red shirt is the subject. Uh, although I'm just sitting here. And the other time you get to ignore that is described in this example. The second is for phrases that begin with the word that. So no comma in that one. The fourth place you need commas is after introductory words. Well, comma, you know I like to start sentences with introductory words. So, comma, you'll see tons of examples of this on my blogs. Yes, comma, you may find it excessive, period. However, comma, that doesn't mean it's not valid, exclamation <laughs> mark. Another place you'll see commas is in between coordinated adjectives. What? I had to look this one up because I've been messing it up because I thought you were supposed to put commas between all adjectives, but I knew sometimes it looked wrong. For those of you whose grammar lessons were long ago and far away, adjectives are words that describe a noun, and a noun is a person, place, or thing. Check out uh, Schoolhouse Rock videos on YouTube. So here's a list of court, an example of a list of co coordinated adjectives. <clears throat> Let's describe a well-rested, comma, happy, comma, contented writer. Besides imaginary, note that I use comma between all of those descriptors. What makes them coordinated? The fact I can reorder them and it doesn't matter. It makes equal sense. I can put the word and in there anywhere and it totally works. So those well-rested, uh, coordinated. So what would make an adjective list uncoordinated? Here's my example. How about a writer fueled by a cold brew mocha latte? Well, still not a description of me. It, at least you'll see that none of those descriptors can be anded. A cold brew and mocha latte just doesn't sound right. They're all describing one particular type of coffee um, rather than the descriptors of that imaginary writer who can be many things at once and they don't have to you know, all go together in one order. And the last place you can use commas is for contrast. This one's a little self-explanatory, but these are typically at the end of a sentence when often you want to invoke a response from the reader or, you know, the person you're talking to in real life. So here's my example. <clears throat> You've used a comma for contrast before, comma, haven't you? demonstrating and explaining at the same time. Oh yeah, we're writers. One more final place to offset dialogue tags. The joy of being a writer is finding the right balance between too many and not enough dialogue tags. Quote, do you ever know, comma, end quote, she asked, comma, open quote, if you've got them right, question mark, close quote, he said, comma, open quote, a proofreader should know, period, close quote, open quote, I hope so, comma, close quote, she replied. Yeah. So now let's talk about where not to use commas. Between verbs, not every use of the word and deserves a comma before it. When you have multiple verbs or verb phrases next to each other, they are not treated like nouns with an Oxford comma. Uh, for those of you who forgot, a verb is simply the action word or the state of being 
used in the sentence describing the subject of the sentence. You don't need a comma to revise and edit your work, for example. Another place you don't need commas is between subjects. The subject of the sentence is the noun or implied noun who is doing the verb action. So Morgan is blogging. Very simple, very simple sentence. Morgan is the subject and a noun is blogging is the action is is a helper verb and stuff. I'm pretty sure since I verbified the word blogging that it's not a gerund in this case, but that's a side note. A gerund for the, is a noun turned into an action by use of adding ing. Anyway, when I have two subjects, even if they're described by a phrase, we don't add a comma. That's a little confusing. Here's an example. The owner of this blog and Ellie are blogging. No comma in there. So sometimes those gerunds I was talking about get used as a subject themselves. Sometimes more of a direct object, whatever. More grammar terms. Here's an example. Writing all night is bad for your health. No comma. So here's where it gets wiggly. It used to be, especially in dialogue, that the writer would put in commas at every instance that the speaker would pause naturally. My voice acting group used to do the same. I mean, it makes sense. But we found we get better and more natural results not dictating every comma. And the publishing world seems to have agreed. Unless it can change the meaning of the sentence, it is currently recommended to avoid commas where not grammatically required or necessary. Now, it can be useful for differentiating voices between characters, the Shatner comma, but much can be said about verb and other word choice as well. Do you have any more comma questions? Anything I got wrong? Let me know in the comments below and I will fix it when I can. And thank you for watching. I'll be back again next week with more writing tips and writerly musings. Bye-bye.